So that being said, um, I'm honored to be introducing today's speaker, who is one of the world's leading experts on international security, especially nuclear policy issues. Um, on April 6, 2009, Rose Gademuller was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. She was the Chief Negotiator of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty with the Russian Federation. Prior to her appointment, Secretary Gademuller worked with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on U.S.-Russian relations and nuclear security and stability. In earlier government service, she served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Energy for Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation and the Assistant Secretary for Nonproliferation and National Security. Earlier in her career, Secretary Gademuller was the Deputy Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. She has written extensively about U.S.-Russian relations and nonproliferation issues and is fluent in Russian. Please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary Gademuller. Thank you very much. Is that still working? Yes, good. Thank you very much, Ariana. It's great to be here today. I had a little chance to walk around your uh, beautiful campus on a gorgeous fall day. Actually, kind of a warm fall day, I take notes. So um, don't stand on ceremony if you've got a sweater or a sweatshirt on and want to take it off. I don't mind one bit. This is my first time in Iowa, believe it or not, um, but I am from the Midwest. My uh, growing up years were spent in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, you know, I'm married to a Californian, and for the first five years of our relationship, he would introduce me, this is Rose from Iowa. And I'd say, no, it's Ohio. And he'd say, Iowa, Ohio, what's the difference? So I have to tell you that I have worked on him now over the last 30 years, and now he's got it straight. But I really do appreciate the chance to be here uh, today at Iowa State University and have an opportunity to speak to you about the New START Treaty. And thank you very much, Ariana, for your kind introduction and uh, to the overall organizers of, uh, of this session today. I am, as it was noted in the introduction, the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance. We call it the AVC Bureau, since everything in Washington goes by an acronym. I know in this day and age, 20 years after the end of the Cold War, I must seem like a bit of an anachronism. I'm a Russian speaker. I'm the, govern the government's chief arms control negotiator. I am both of these things when Afghanistan, global terrorism, and extremism are the greatest threats that our country faces. It is true that since 1991, arms control has not gotten the attention from the media and public that it once did. The Cold War ended, and for the average American, the threat of nuclear war just kind of drifted away. What's the last time you heard about students in an elementary school having to do a duck and cover drill and get under their desks because of a nuclear exercise? But the threat is real, and in fact, it may have increased because today we are concerned about nuclear terrorism. And thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons still exist in the world, and tons and tons of fissile material that could be used to make a nuclear bomb. So it is still a real problem. And with this in mind, President Obama has reinvigorated efforts to further limit and reduce nuclear weapons. The president, in April 2009, gave a speech in Prague where he spoke about his vision of a world without nuclear weapons and recognized the need to create the conditions to bring about such a world. So with that in mind, the president tasked me and my great team to go to Geneva and work on negotiating the New START Treaty. This treaty is very important because the United States and Russia possess more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. When the New START Treaty is fully implemented, it will result in the lowest number of deployed nuclear weapons since the 1950s, the dawn of the nuclear age. So it is a significant step in the continuing process of reducing and eliminating nuclear arms. I wanted to talk a little bit about the experience of negotiating this treaty. It follows on a treaty that was signed during the Cold War. George H.W. Bush and President Gorbachev signed the START Treaty in Moscow in July of 1991, and within six months the Soviet Union had fallen apart. So it was right at the end of the Cold War when the START Treaty was signed and brought into force. That treaty expired 15 years later, 
on December 5th of last year. So we knew it was necessary to replace the expiring START treaty with a new agreement that would reflect arms control progress over the last 15 years, but also take into account that the Cold War is over and the United States and Russian Federation are developing a different kind of relationship. You've probably heard this term, the reset button, that uh, President Obama launched uh, as actually it was pretty funny, my boss Hillary Clinton launched it with uh, with Minister Lavrov, and turns out we had the Russian translation wrong. If some of you speak Russian, we had uh, used um, basically not the word for rebooting, like you know rebooting your computer, but we'd used a word that simply meant overload. <laughs> so it was kind of, and we were joking during the first uh, months of the negotiation that actually we we were going to have to avoid overload in the negotiating process and getting on each other's nerves. In fact, it was a much different kind of negotiation from the Cold War years. I participated in the START negotiations in 1990, and I remember how they were essentially in a Cold War environment. But we launched into these negotiations in um, a kind of business-like mood and really were resolved, even if we were butting heads, as we did frequently during the negotiations, that we would have a very straightforward, practical approach. Over the course of the year-long negotiations, we got to know our counterparts pretty well, and we benefited a lot from the experience, actually, that both sets of experts brought to the negotiating table. I had inspectors on my negotiating team who had worked through the 15 years of the start negotiations on inspecting Russian facilities, and they'd been inside all the Russian Strategic Nuclear Forces facilities. Same on the Russian side. So those groups of inspectors and weapon system operators brought their experience to the negotiating table in Geneva, and it was really beneficial because they had thought through what needed to go into the new treaty, number one, but number two, they actually knew each other, you know, and they had, they weren't friends or anything like that, but they had professional regard for each other. They understood that's a guy from the Russian Strategic Rocket Forces. He knows about intercontinental ballistic missiles. I work for our strategic command. I know about intercontinental ballistic missiles. So there was a lot of mutual respect on both sides of the table. And that's what I mean when I talk about the quality of this negotiation being different from the one I experienced back in 1990 when I was working on the START delegation. Another thing that was very interesting is that we spoke each other's languages. Back, you know, in 1990, there were very few people on the U.S. side of the table who spoke Russian. I was one of the only ones who was not a professional interpreter. But this time around, again, because all the inspectors had to learn Russian to go and do those inspections in the Russian Federation. We had a lot of Russian speakers on our side of the table, and there were a lot of English speakers on the Russian side of the table. And that really sped things along. It increased uh, our understanding and moved things along very quickly in terms of overall comprehension. But you know the most heartening thing for me in terms of the negotiations were the number of young people who were involved. The inspecting teams, the weapon system operators were uh, younger people in their uh, late 20s and 30s, most of them. And for me, I'm a Sputnik baby. You know, I started in this uh, world back in 1957 when my dad took me out into the front yard in Columbus, Ohio, and said, see that little dot going across the sky? The Soviets have sent up a satellite. They call it the Sputnik. And I was really interested in that. You know, I was an elementary school kid. I was really interested in it, and it started, it kind of spurred my interest in the Russians and what they were doing. And, of course, that was the Cold War. It was the era of the space race. We were concerned about a nuclear attack. It was before the Cuban Missile Crisis. So those were crisis years, very negative years in our relationship with the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, it spurred my interest to see what was going on. But I was essentially, you know, a child of the Cold War. But this new crop, those who worked together through the inspection process of the START Treaty, working together, again, that mutual respect developing, it meant that they really had no preconceived notions from previous arms control negotiations. And I think that that was useful, too. So after a year of intense work, we reached a deal. And on April 8, 2009, I'm sorry, 2010, President Obama and President Medvedev got together in Prague and signed the New START Treaty. President Obama called it an important milestone for nuclear security and nonproliferation and for U.S.-Russian relations overall. And President Medvedev declared it a win-win situation.
Now, this was really unusual. If you know the Russians, they're into zero-sum games quite frequently. And so for the president of the Russian Federation to call this treaty a win-win situation was very unusual in the Russian political scene overall. And I took special note of it at that time. Because President Medvedev doesn't speak English. He understands it pretty well, but he doesn't speak it. But he said in English and in Russian that this was a win-win situation. Let me talk just a little bit about the treaty um, and then about our ratification process, and then I'll be happy to throw the floor open to questions. The treaty is built on two basic principles. One is flexibility. As the number of nuclear weapons in the world goes smaller and smaller, as we begin to reduce and eliminate them further, we are going to have to have the maximum flexibility possible to deploy our strategic forces in the most efficient, effective, and reliable way we see fit. So it's very important that the basic concept of flexibility be there in this treaty, and it is. But the other important basic concept is predictability. We have to be able to know what is going on inside the Russian strategic nuclear forces, and they have to know what's going on with us. Otherwise, we're cast back to the kind of worst case planning of the Cold War, when we have to build up and modernize, they have to build up and modernize without understanding exactly what's going on inside the nuclear forces of either country. And we'd be end up ending up spending money on nuclear forces when we really need to be spending our money elsewhere on supporting our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan on working in other areas to modernize and support our armed forces. So that was very important as well, to have a strong and effective verification regime that would give us the predictability we, know we need to know what's going on inside the Russian nuclear forces. The verification regime of the New START Treaty is based on a couple of things. It's based on so-called national technical means. Those are satellites, overhead satellites. Russians have no control over them. We have no control over their satellites. But that's a, a kind of core foundation to have that satellite capability to look down into their country and see what's going on. The other thing is an extensive set of data exchanges and notifications. We keep each other informed of what's going on. Restrictions on where specified items can be located. Missiles can only be located in certain places, basing facilities, for example. And most importantly, on-site inspections. The New START Treaty will provide for the resumption of vital on-site inspections of Russian strategic nuclear facilities and reciprocally for the Russians to come to our strategic nuclear facilities. When the START Treaty went out of force in December 2009, uh, our ability to have inspectors in Russia went away. And for almost a year now, in fact, 340 days, we have not had what Senator Lugar likes to call boots on the ground in the Russian Federation. So it's very important, I think, for that reason, to move toward getting the uh, New START Treaty ratified and entered into force, because there is no substitute for on-site inspection. They provide the kind of insider knowledge of what's going on with the Russian strategic forces that help us, again, to escape the necessity of worst case planning and maybe spending more than we would like to on, the Russian, on our nuclear forces. So simply put, the United States is more secure and safer when our country has, uh, has that on-site inspection capability because it helps us gain a better understanding of what's going on inside the Russian strategic nuclear arsenal. Now let me bring you up to date on ratification because a lot has been happening over the last uh, week since the election last Tuesday. In September, mid-September, September 16th, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee approved a draft of resolution of advice and consent for the New START Treaty by a vote of 14 to 4. And we were very pleased about that. It was a strong bipartisan vote with three Republican senators joining the uh, Democratic majority to vote in favor of the treaty. Now the full Senate must vote to give its advice and consent to ratification of the treaty so it can enter into force. And we are urging that this process take place now during the lame duck session of the Senate that will begin next Monday. Now is the time to finish the job. President Obama said it very well last week when he said, this is not traditionally a Democratic or Republican issue, but rather an issue of American national security. 
He noted that passage of the treaty will send a strong signal to Russia that we are serious about reducing nuclear arsenals and a signal to the world that we're serious about nonproliferation. There has traditionally been broad bipartisan uh, support for these kinds of treaties. I mentioned the START Treaty that President Bush and President Gorbachev signed in 1991. It was approved in 1992 by a vote of 93 votes to six. And the Moscow Treaty negotiated by President George W. Bush was approved in 2003 by a vote of 95 to zero. We are hoping that the New START Treaty will receive similar strong bipartisan support. Senator Kerry, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is ready to move forward. He has said uh, that passing the New START Treaty is an urgent imperative. And my own boss, Hillary Clinton, I just saw her yesterday. She just got back from a trip throughout the Asia Pacific region. And last week when she was in New Zealand, she said that we are working hard to pass the treaty. We believe we have enough votes to pass it in the Senate. It's just a question of when it will be brought up for a vote. And I talked to her yesterday when she got off the plane coming back from, uh, from New Zealand and Australia, and she reiterated that message very, very strongly. So everybody's revving up uh, to get to work on this. And um, I just want to stress that we believe the New START Treaty is in the national security interest of the United States, and it's time for the Senate to provide its advice and consent to the New START Treaty. Now, just to conclude, I wanted to say a couple words to you because I know that there are many in this audience either studying Russian and Russian affairs or studying political science, international relations, some of you serving in our armed forces. I wanted to stress that while we've been working hard on getting this New START Treaty finished and thinking through the next steps in arms reduction and nonproliferation, it's your generation that is going to be left with a lot more work to be done in this area. You did not ask for this deadly inheritance. You did not contribute to the problems that brought it about during the Cold War years. But we cannot change the past that brought us to this point. But I wanted to say to you all that you can change the future, definitely. At times, eliminating the threat of nuclear weapons may seem like a daunting task. But I'd like to end with a quote by Henry Stimson, who served in the mid-20th century as both the Secretary of War and the Secretary of State. He faced enormous challenges on, in both of those roles. But he noted in his autobiography something that really came home to me as I was reading over these remarks this morning. He said, the man who tries to work for good, believing in its eventual victory, while he may suffer setback and even disaster, will never know defeat. The only deadly sin I know is cynicism. And I agree with that 100%. So we're going to do the best we can to wrestle with this problem. Certainly I will in, in the time I have left in my working life. And then it'll be over to you. But I hope that you too will be gripped with this problem as with others and help to wrestle it to the ground. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Question, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the question was, uh, can I tell uh, what number of nuclear weapons each side has at the present time? At the present time, under uh, the so-called Moscow Treaty, the United States and Russia have uh, between 1,700 and 2,200 deployed strategic offensive weapons. And there's a difference slightly. There was that range in the Moscow Treaty. Um, so there's a slight difference between what the United States and Russia has. Under the new treaty, we will have 1,550 deployed nuclear weapons on 700 launch vehicles. That means either intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or um, bomber weapons. So um, it. Uh, it is a reduction in those numbers. As I said, it's down to a level that is lower than uh, any time since the 1950s in terms of operationally deployed weapons. But one thing I wanted to mention is this does not say anything about non-deployed weapons. And there are still many, many thousands of non-deployed weapons in both the Russian nuclear arsenal 
and the U.S. nuclear arsenal. By some estimates, and the Russians keep these numbers secret, but by some estimates, they still have almost 10,000 nuclear warheads that are non-deployed in storage facilities. Some of them are not meant for delivery on strategic intercontinental systems like intercontinental ballistic missiles, but are for use in uh, tactical, what we call, or non-strategic uses in areas along the Russian periphery. So I just want to make you aware that there are different classes of weapons. What we need to wrestle with in the next negotiation, and President Obama spoke about that in Prague when he signed the New START Treaty with President Medvedev. He said the next negotiation is going to turn to tackling non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons, those shorter range systems, and also non-deployed nuclear weapons, weapons in storage facilities. So as I just wanted to put that message out there to give you a feel that the, the task is still a very large one in terms of systems that are deployed, you know, targeted against each other today, we're doing very well. We've come down from the Cold War high of 12,000 approximately deployed nuclear weapons on both sides down to under this treaty 1550 when it is fully implemented. So that's a big improvement in the number of deployed systems. But we've still got to wrestle with the, the weapons that are not deployed and sitting in storage facilities. It's going to be a big job in terms of eliminating them and uh, getting rid of their fissile material and everything else that will have to happen. So that's why I'm saying there's still a lot of work ahead of us. Yes, please. That's a very good question. The question was, um, are we planning to get any other countries involved in this? Uh, the other nuclear weapon states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty are the UK, France, Russia, China, and the United States, so five. But there are other states that we know have nuclear weapons, India and Pakistan, for example, have tested nuclear weapons. And they're you know, now in a kind of regional standoff that is, I think, uh, problematic. But, uh, and then we have the so-called, well, emerging nuclear powers like North Korea that, uh, and Iran uh, that we are very, very worried about as well as a proliferation problem. So yes, and in fact, the attention of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in May of this year was on what we can do to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. And out of that non-proliferation treaty review conference, there came um, an action plan that was a big step exactly in the direction you're talking about because it, it has a number of tasks or steps in it for tackling the proliferation problems. North Korea, again, very, very uh, uh, big example. And also for then getting all of the P5 involved in this process. And in fact, it's a first that uh, the P5 will now be beginning uh, to meet together. France announced in May that we we're going to uh, hold a conference in the first half of 2011 to get the whole P5 together to talk about the problems of verifying uh, or having transparency measures with regard to nuclear, uh, nuclear um, arms reductions. This is all part of a step-by-step -step approach. And we say in the preamble to the New START Treaty that we have now begun a step-by-step -step approach that will lead to a multilateral process. But truly, up to this point, and through uh, the Cold War, this has been a bilateral effort between the Soviet Union and the United States in latter years between the Russian Federation and the United States. So it really has been a bilateral effort because, as I said in my remarks, we have had, and even today we have, 90 percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. But still, it's a very important effort now to begin to draw the rest of the P5 to the table and uh, continue to wrestle with those other uh, states like, like the North Koreas and Irans of the world. So, yes, ma'am. That was a nightmare scenario at the time the Soviet Union broke apart in 1991, 1992. What was going to happen to all the warheads? Because not only were warheads left in the Russian Federation, but when the Soviet Union fell apart, there were thousands of warheads left in Ukraine and in Kazakhstan and in Belarus. And we had to figure out you know, how to handle this problem because, first of all, we didn't want 
four nuclear weapon states emerging from the breakup of the Soviet Union, but we were also worried about the loose nukes problem, that you know this um, kind of wide dispersal and the breakdown of what was really a, a severe breakdown in, in funding, financing for uh, the uh, nuclear arsenal in the former Soviet Union. We were very, very concerned, as were people in that part of the world, that uh, we could start to see a thriving black market, not only in fissile materials, but also in, in actual warheads. Uh, being sold on the black market. So there was a big effort undertaken in the 1990s, and Senator Lugar and at that time Senator Sam Nunn launched a program that's called the Nunn-Lugar Program, or its official name is the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. And we, on an annual basis now, uh, spent uh, millions of dollars to work with the Russians to improve the physical protection of their warheads and their fissile materials, and that's been a very, very important program. It's done a lot of work in the last 15 years to, uh, to really improve the physical protection of uh, warheads and fissile materials in that part of the world. Are we there yet? We're a lot farther along the road. I can't tell you that I'm 100% confident, but definitely, definitely, it's something that has gotten people's attention. They recognize it as a matter of concern, and it's something we're working on very hard. So. Question back there? Oh, that was your question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, all of those discussions are going on as we speak, really. As I said, it's been a very active time uh, in Washington. I will point out that the context in which President Obama talked about the treaty last week, it's the foreign policy priority for working with the Senate in the lame duck session. Obviously, you're, you're right, the tax cuts, that's going to be not number one, but close to number one in terms of domestic priorities. There's also got to be a continuing resolution. Some of you may recall the problems with the uh, shutdown of the government back, uh, back some years ago uh, in the mid-1990s. We don't want to see problems like that emerge again. The problems with regard to ensuring that uh, defense authorization is nailed down before they go out. So there's a lot of work that this lame duck session has to do, but in terms of foreign policy priorities, this is it. The New START Treaty is the foreign policy priority. So we're, we're going to keep pushing. Yes. Well, interestingly enough, um, I'm a classic Washington uh, revolving door type because um, I really started my career working in think tanks. I worked uh, for the Rand Corporation for many years when I was pursuing my uh, graduate degree at George Washington University. Uh, worked on uh, the modernization at that time of the Soviet strategic forces, what was happening with, with their strategic weapons. Uh, then, uh, when the Clinton administration came around, I was invited to uh, join as a political appointee the Clinton administration, and I worked in that uh, way on, um, on the efforts with getting nuclear weapons out of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. So I was involved in that during, during those years. When the Clinton administration ended, <coughs> excuse me, that's when I went to the Carnegie Endowment, back to the think tank world. So I've been in and out of government. Um, as a political appointee and not kind of making a career of government service. Uh, my husband, quite, quite different. He did make a career of government service, but he's been working on, on the environment and science side. He's been a specialist on the Arctic and the Antarctic. So he did come up and stay in the State Department um, for the bulk of his career. So there are different ways to go about it. I will say that there are some really, really good internship programs in Washington, and if you're interested in government service, I would highly recommend the State Department's internship program because it takes a wide array of students from across the country. I've had some absolutely terrific interns uh, working uh, for me. And by the way, there's something also called the Stay in School program that if you are a full-time student and you just want to come to Washington during the summer and work, 
um, and maybe, well, probably if you're living out in Iowa, you don't want to come over the holiday period in the winter. But nevertheless, there are different kinds of programs that can give you an opportunity to come and, and taste what it's like to work in the Department of State and in other government agencies as well. For example, the latter years of the Clinton administration I spent in the Department of Energy as the Assistant Secretary there responsible for nonproliferation programs. And we had a really good nonproliferation internship program that is still flourishing. So if you want to taste, you know, that's a more technical program for people who have done nuclear physics and, and that type of thing, or nuclear engineering. So um, I'd really urge you, if you're interested, there are, there's a wealth of programs uh, both in and out of government in Washington, and uh, they sometimes take some time to get into because you usually have to get a security clearance, and that can take six to eight months. So um, I would urge you, if you're interested, to, uh, to look into it because they are, um, I think, very successful programs in, in giving people a flavor for what it's like to work for the government. And maybe you decide it's not for you, but I've known people, and when we were living and working in Moscow, I served for three years as the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, and my husband was in our U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and he had interns come, you know, they were college students like you, and they would come for the summer and work in Moscow. So there are even opportunities to work in foreign embassies as an intern. Um, but again, you just have to get started early if you want to do it. So I, uh, I do highly recommend it. Other questions? Uh, how about over here? Well, I think, you know, to be honest, uh, the question was at what, what point will arms reductions cause an insufficient deterrent? And that is worthy of a whole probably seminar of discussion as to you know, what the implications will be as nuclear numbers come lower and lower. I think one of the important debates and discussion in the field today is about the role of what some people call a virtual deterrent. Even if everybody gets down to zero, and of course we would only do that. By the way, President Obama has said that this is a beginning of movement on this road to eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. But he says, I don't expect this to happen in my lifetime. This must be a careful step-by-step -step approach, taking true account of all the regional security problems that will have to be dealt with. I talked about the relationship between India and Pakistan. I don't see that being resolved anytime soon. Those are the kinds of very sticky regional security issues that will have to be dealt with before we can truly come down to zero. So it's a careful step-by-step -step reduction in reliance on nuclear weapons and then taking careful account of all of these strategic stability questions that arise. But even in the case that we do get down to zero, there is going to be what people call a kind of virtual nuclear capability. And here, you know, the United States with uh, wealth of experience over the years of the Cold War is going to have virtual capability to reconstitute its nuclear uh, potential if it had to do so. So it's uh, one of those, again, questions for further discussion and debate and study over a long period of time. And people, in fact, when I leave here, when I leave Iowa, tomorrow I'm flying out to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University where we are uh, having a big conference on nuclear deterrence with this very question being at the center of it. So it's a very active question for debate. But the reason I welcome so much uh, President Obama's uh, call to be thinking about this is that it has reinvigorated both our efforts to reduce our um, reliance on nuclear weapons. It's reinvigorated as well our efforts to strengthen the nonproliferation regime. And I could see it directly when we left you know, the negotiating table in Geneva, the president signed the treaty in, in Prague. Then we had a so-called nuclear security summit in the third week of April in Washington where uh, presidents came from around the world and prime ministers, and they all signed up to trying to get their fissile materials, their uh, materials that could be used to make nuclear weapons, under more safe and secure storage, once again, within four years. So everybody signed up.
to this very, very ambitious goal of improving physical protection of fissile materials in the next four years. So that was a great kind of step forward. People then went to the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference the next month in May in New York, and as I said, we came out with a great result in the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. So I can see that there's this kind of momentum developing and people are paying attention to these problems again. And they are problems that really, I think, must be dealt with because if not, we're going to face forever the threat of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of terrorists. And that is the threat that really keeps me awake at night these days. It's not the threat of a massive nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States. It's the threat of nuclear terrorism. Further questions? You had another question. Yes, the yes, definitely. Um, the Department of State website. Um, you just you know go to the Department of State website overall, and they have you know the internships listed uh, there. You know. In the Department of Energy, if you're interested in that internship program, it's called the Nonproliferation Internship Program. Um, so, and each of the government agencies has, uh, you know, information about internships available on their websites, basically. So, yes. Yes, this question has to do with the overall effect on the U.S.-Russian relationship of, um, of cultural exchange and whether it had any direct effect on our negotiations with the Russians in this case. I will tell you that, uh, personally, um, I believe it's had a great effect. I started out my career uh, in the Soviet Union at that time in 1976 as a, uh, an exhibit guide with a cultural exchange exhibit that was called Photography USA, and we traveled around all over the Soviet Union. I was in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and Kiev, Ukraine. We were all over the place. And uh, that was a really terrific program that went on. You mentioned 1959, the so-called kitchen debate in Moscow, and that you know went on. Uh, through the years of the Cold War, and it really did a lot, I think, to bring our two countries together. But uh, for me personally, it was a vital training ground because, first of all, it hooked me into wanting to continue working um, on Russia problems, and it really cemented my Russian language capability and pushed, you know, basically pushed me into the field. So it was very important, and I think that's the experience of others who have served as exhibit guides on uh, U.S.-Russian exchange exhibits. Uh, they have, they, we now form a kind of band of brothers, you know, working on issues to do with the former Soviet Union and the Russian Federation. So it's definitely had an effect. As to at the negotiating table, I would say the biggest effect was a more specialized, again, cultural effect from the experience of implementing the START Treaty and that we'd had this 15 years of experience with inspectors working together, uh, inspecting each other's nuclear facilities, the weapon system operators. Very interesting for me in Geneva because I'd have an inspector on my team and, you know, uh, uh, Colonel Ivanov would arrive from Moscow and he'd say, oh yeah, I know Colonel Ivanov. He was the commandant of their strategic rocket forces facility at Tekova. Oh yeah, and you go up and talk to them, you know, and they'd, you know, start discussing um, basically some of the problems that they had encountered during the inspection process of START. And so that kind of communication between the two sides, I think, really facilitated uh, what we tried to do in this treaty, which was to make for a more efficient and effective inspection re regime that uh, had procedures that were honed, you know, to be as basically as effective as possible and also escape being a drag on the operations of the strategic forces because both sides found, I know our Navy, for example, found that uh, they were frequently closing down submarine bases, our submarine bases for extended periods of time for, uh, for inspection. So they were looking for ways to kind of streamline uh, 
so that we wouldn't lose out uh, so much in terms of ops tempo, operational tempo. So those are the kinds of things we tried to, uh, to work on in this negotiation. And the fact that we had this kind of, uh, well, I'm not going to call it a cultural exchange. It was a very technical exchange over the years of implementing START. But that kind of direct communication was, in fact, very effective in this, in this particular negotiation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's a very good uh, question. Um, in fact, it can be very, very difficult to deal with um, because you have, to, you have to handle it very carefully. Fissile material, again, you have to keep uh, very safe and secure because, again, if you know how to make a nuclear bomb, you take that fissile, fissile material and you can reconstitute a nuclear bomb. It's very, very dangerous. So we treat it very, very carefully. I was just out uh, last week at the... Uh, National Nuclear Security Site in Nevada and also at our Sandia National Laboratory in, in Albuquerque and those are places that wrestle with these problems all the time, how to you know, eliminate fissile material very safely and securely. The most, I would say, successful effort that we've had since the Cold War in getting rid of a lot of fissile material is a program that we, again, agreed with the Russians as the Soviet Union was breaking apart. It's the so-called highly enriched uranium deal, or HEU deal. When fissile material comes out of a nuclear weapon, it is highly enriched. It's enriched above 20%. And it can, as I said, be used directly in a bomb. The way you get it out of that status is to downblend it so it's enriched below 20 percent and then it can be used for peaceful purposes it can be used for nuclear power plant fuel so we agreed with the russians as they reduce and eliminate their nuclear warheads that we would take their highly enriched uranium downblend it below 20 percent and sell it as nuclear power plant fuel and then you know return the proceeds to them this has been a highly successful program, and people don't know it, but 20% of the nuclear power, of the, of the electricity in this country is as a result of nuclear power, and today the bulk of that nuclear power is coming from fuel that was fabricated from former Soviet nuclear warheads. So it's an amazing program, and it's been very, very successful. That, to me, is the best way that we have eliminated fissile material. In our own case, uh, we've also had some fissile material declared as excess, and it gets the same kind of treatment. It can be downblended for civilian use. So there's a lot of ways I just wanted to convey. It is a big problem because, you know, there's tons and tons of this stuff, and it has to be dealt with very, very carefully. You can't just kind of leave it sitting around because it can cause then proliferation problems, particularly if it falls into the wrong hands and uh, gets sold or stolen to use in terrorist nuclear devices. I can't stress enough the way this problem of terrorists getting their hands on fissile material warheads, that is the leading threat today, and it's the one we're wrestling with as we try to address the nuclear problem. Yes. This uh, is, again, a... Uh, an abiding problem. It's not, I've, forgive me, it's not my area of expertise really. I do know that uh, we have, you know, basically now a problem because we are storing spent nuclear uh, fuel in storage pools around nuclear power plants. We have to deal with that uh, problem. Um, but uh, I'm frankly not really up on what the current status of our efforts in that regard are. So I'm not going to go any further than to say it's a bad problem. Anything further? No? If not, well, thank you very, very much for your attention today. I'm glad you could come. It's very uh, great to be here at Iowa State and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the New START Treaty. Thank you.